The growing field of climate communication began some years back with the recognition that uh, the information deficit model is for the most part false. And that, um, so what's the information deficit model? Dan explained it, let me just try to make sure we're all on the same page. Why, here's the puzzle. Why do so many people deny a basic fact that all, well, 96, 97%, uh, of working climate scientists except as incontrovertible. The fact, over the past century, humans are causing the earth, including the oceans, the atmosphere, to warm up. The emissions of greenhouse gases is making a dramatic difference to the environment, largely to, uh, due to CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels, and the effects are gonna be catastrophic. And this has been proven beyond any reasonable doubt. That's a fact. So the, just to be painfully clear, the, the information deficit model uh, is the idea that, well, if people only knew the facts and maybe a little bit of climate science, they'd recognize that humans are causing global warming and begin to argue about what, if anything, we ought to be doing about uh, mitigating and uh, adapting to anthropogenic global warming, not whether the National Academies of Science and every other scientific organization representing reputable scientists on Earth uh, should be trusted, right? Um, yet here we are. So um, I'm not calling that irrationality in the same kind of way. That, that's, so uh, the field of, of climate communication became interesting when, when Dan, others uh, noticed that, that this information deficit model was just wrong. Uh, <clears throat> as it turns out, scientists can at times be really good at talking to other scientists. But with regard to informing and changing the beliefs of most people who are undecided about or deny what almost all scientists believe, even the best scientists, journalists, and teachers uh, well, they've been the ones that helped to prove that the information deficit model is wrong, right? Um, we stink collectively. Uh, and provi providing missing information just doesn't change belief. Now, even if uh, John Krasnick's left, but we talked a bit last night after his thing, even if the uh, data that he presented yesterday is true, that doesn't change this. See, that's just a matter of how um, uh, how, whether it applies to more or fewer people in that way. The one piece that um, uh, Dan's gonna crunch some numbers for me on is he asked two questions, for those of you who remember. Um, uh, is the earth probably warming or not? And uh, are, are humans the cause, if it is, right? And, you know, you, polling, you gotta like not do double-barreled questions and so on, but the fact is some combination of those two, right? It's a conjunction. It's that humans are causing global warming. And uh, the 80% that Dan got to the hypothetical question, if it's being caused, it's gonna be slightly lower numbers when he goes back and crunches this data. For those who said, yes, the Earth is warming, and also said, if it's warming, then humans caused it, that number is gonna be lower, of course, than the 80%, but it's still the same problem, right? Now, Dan also suggested that maybe the problem is with politicians and not the public. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, John suggested that, that um, uh, it may be with politicians and not the public, but I think when you look at those new numbers, there's a, still a really big gap between um, uh, public views of these things and, and what the facts are, what, what's quite known. So, uh, I'm not a cognitive psychologist or a communication specialist, uh, and my expertise, if I have any on this topic, is in academic philosophy and education. Uh, I've taught logic and critical thinking and ethics and philosophy of science and environmental ethics mostly to college students, but also to uh, 
K through 12 settings and, and professional development settings for 30 something years. Uh, one of the projects that um, uh, was mentioned is um, that I, I helped design and run was called Reading and Writing for Critical Thinking. And it's um, still going on in 35 or 40 countries and it, um, it's reached a couple of hundred thousand teachers and a couple of million students. And we've had outside assessments um, by you know really good groups and there are things you never hear in education improvement projects, people couldn't believe it when it was presented at uh, AERA because there were statistically significant results, you know, which you kind of never really get. And I mention this because I have some experience in reasoning about moral and policy issues with people who don't share the same values uh, across other cultures uh, and within ours. And um, in, in my experience, I failed in pretty much every way you can. Um, the um, failures are comical. I try to learn from them. Uh, they're frustrating. Um, but part of what the failures come from is that philosophers, like the scientists, operate with an analog to the information deficit model, which I'm, I'm beginning to rethink. So I, I appreciate your help in helping me rethink this. We've got this regulative principle that helps us get out of bed in the morning and go to work, that people adopt beliefs because they have evidence or reasons of the relevant sort. And that they act in ways that are based on reasons and principles that they believe for good reasons to be true. Um, but like scientists, this is kind of the point I'm getting to of some substance, the reason um, the way we reason with people, uh, very often when we're trying to disabuse people of misinformation, reinforces the beliefs we're trying to um, uh, loosen. So the um, thing is, people really are just so damn irrational sometimes uh, in, a, in a different sense than, than what Dan said. So how people actually think is what cognitive psychologist study, and uh, I want to share just a couple of quick results from cognitive psych that are relevant to climate communication, but have broader uh, implications. The, the beyond climate communication is, I don't know, it's a little provocative. It's, I'm not really going that far beyond it. It's just it applies to other things. It, it, it has some other <clears throat> implications, um, by the way, you know, my, my shameless self from a promotion for a blog, if you want to read a good one, I, I would suggest Jim's and uh, the one I'm about to mention. They're really good and, and I've learned a lot from it. The, the kinds of ways that people, the patterns of irrationality that um, I want to look at uh, that cognitive psychologists um, have shown experimentally in other kind of settings are really, um, if they're not universal, they're pretty damn close in my experience. And it, maybe it's even because of the way that we're hardwired to process memory. And memory plays a very important role in how we change beliefs. Uh, and um, uh, so here they are. I'm going to present three of them really quickly from a little handbook. Um, done by um, um, John Cook and Stefan Lewandowski that, uh, how many of you have seen this, by the way? It's good, isn't it? Uh, I, I think it's really good for the rest of you. I'm sorry, most of what I'm gonna do is just present. Uh, Stefan Lewandowski and I are working on, uh, at the early stages on a paper that kind of links one of these things, uh, one of these backfire effects with um, uh, things like, um, identity protective cognition and things like that. So um, you can get this, you can download it from Skeptical Science, uh, an excellent blog that John Cook runs. He's skeptical of the people who are skeptical of science, just so you're clear about that. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a quick, easy read. It's got like big print cartoons and yeah, some actual real substance, I think. 
So here's the first effect, the first backfire effect, that the way we reason about things actually reinforces misinformation rather than disabusing it. Um, people were shown a flyer that debunked common myths about flu vaccines. After uh, they were then asked to separate the myths from the facts. When uh, asked immediately after reading the flyer, people were pretty successful in identifying the, the myths. But how does memory work in terms of belief change? Well, uh, if you wait just as little as 30 minutes, people actually wound up scoring worse than they did if they hadn't read the flyer debunking the myths, right? Um, it's, um, uh, it's a very striking result. Of all places to find it, sorry, the reference is small, um, but Schoenig, Yoon, uh, Park, and Schwartz wrote a really nice paper about it called How Warnings About False Claims Become Recommendations, and it's in the Journal of Consumer Research. And if you download it, it's really quite a clear, easy to read, um, but I think striking kind of um, result. So the idea is if you give somebody a myth and then a whole lot of facts, that's what they remember, the myths. Okay. Um, the best approach here is just to focus, uh, I think, in the repetition that, that Jim was talking about, focus on the facts you wish to communicate. Um, because if you start with the facts and say, oh, by the way, and this myth is myth, then it turns out they wind up remembering the facts. And this function of memory plays a role in individual belief change. Okay? Uh, to me, this, this was kind of striking because I like to get my fingernails dirty and really go into the reasons why you should get rid of this. Man, and that's just really a kind of pedagogically dumb approach, as it turns out. But uh, I'm kind of stuck with it. Now, the second effect uh, is called uh, the overkill backfire effect, which is related to what I just said. And the idea is that a simple myth to most people, most of us, is just more cognitive, cognitively attractive than an uh, overly complicated correction of it, okay? Same sort of thing as the familiarity, right? But the idea is overkill um, um, gives you something too complicated to be attractive to hang, for your memory to hang on to over time. Uh, so um, keep it short, simple, you know, and if you get into the weeds and complicated, go back and emphasize what are the key points, one, two, three, you know. Three is actually a pretty good number. Okay, finally, the one that, that matters to me the most now because this is the one I'm beginning to work with, with Stefan Lewandowski. Now, now Stefan has published, I don't know, 100, 150 articles in places like Brain and Behavior. He does real memory research. John Cook is a communicator and does real good work on this kind of thing. And this is, to me, where work needs to be done in terms of conceptually understanding how different efforts fit together, okay? In my view, um, the Cultural Cognition Project, Tony Lazarowitz's work, have been working on the worldview backfire effect. Um, but the idea is when you have central beliefs, teaching philosophy, I find this all the time because our goal is challenge central beliefs, religious ones, moral ones, ones that form really core beliefs in terms of people's worldviews, this gets often not the blank stares, but genuine antagonism from my students. And that's when I know I'm doing something right. But the genuine antagonism, how often is it followed by really reevaluating those kinds of things? So if you're strongly fixed, as we all are in certain views, figuring out what they are is the key, encountering counter arguments causes us to kind of marshal our forces, like you know, an army of white blood cells, to um, uh, defend against them. 
Uh, now, this got demonstrated well. I'm running out of time, so you can, you can read it elsewhere. But um, uh, Steve Lewandowski demonstrated this with a really neat little experiment about uh, Saddam Hussein being linked to the 9-11 terrorist attacks, providing evidence there wasn't any link between the two. It included a quote uh, directly from then-President Bush. Only 2% of participants changed their mind after that. And um, uh, although, interestingly, 14% denied they had ever believed the link in the first place. Um, vast majority clung to the link between Iraq and 9-11, which I don't think existed. Uh, and they employed an incredibly creative range of arguments to um, uh, defend that. And this, there is a very nice reference in um, uh, a volume down below that you can find uh, to that experiment. So when debunking a myth, this is Stefan's work. I'm going to go really fast now. Uh, the idea is, since you're creating a gap in someone's mind, fill the gap with something else, right, uh, is the point, right? If you're removing a myth, replace it with an alternative narrative. Okay, now let me just say in two minutes kind of what I, I want as a, a takeaway from this. Um, uh, first, the beyond climate communication. I've been working for many years trying to understand uh, science denial a bit more generally and in particular uh, evolution uh, and how that functions and what beliefs those are associated with. It's not as it turns out simply certain religious beliefs per se, as I had initially thought it was. Um, secondly, and I really want to emphasize this, climate communication and these results or this conceptual framework that at least I'm suggesting, um, particularly about the worldview backfire effects, it isn't a matter of just sugarcoating your words so that the message goes down smoothly. I want to repeat that, because there's where I am challenging some of the climate communication community. It's not a matter of making the way you say it more palatable to the values that they already have, okay? And I think that's an unfortunate move that some folks are making. Values, I'm tethered. Values are lenses through which we view the world through which we view facts. If you look at the lenses instead of through them, you're engaging people in reasoning, okay? You're not just sugarcoating messages. And the key is to figure out which values, hierarchical and egalitarian and um, uh, communitarian and individual are certainly key ones. The data seems kind of hard to, to say it isn't, but there are others as well, it seems to me. And besides being lenses through which we just see facts, in communication, as, as Dan mentioned to me quickly over breakfast, they can also be like switches or logic gates that just shut off the flow of information in that kind of way. One minute. So I think there is a role for real reasoning with minimally rational people, that is people who do believe things for reasons, which I think most people do. It's just understanding what they are. And um, we've had a lot over the last few days that I found quite interesting of, do we socially engineer from the top down? Do we try to motivate people from their reasoning in terms of how they act on what kind of beliefs? Surely all are, you know, relevant for different kind of audiences, but it seems to me engaging people in real reasoning, real dialogue uh, about this uh, is fairly important. I do this a lot with younger people because I, I, I'm, I don't have as much hope for the um, older generations. Uh, people are more formative before they're 25 uh, on this front, but there, there may be ways to 
to um, engage others at different levels that you're much more expert at. So sorry, I don't know if I've added anything new to this other than maybe a tiny bit of clarification, but that's it, thanks. <laughs>